How you there, everybody? Good to see you again. We're live. Sorry, I'm a little late getting going again, but by now you expect that probably. So thanks for uh, tuning in and watching again. We're going to do some more drawing. So let me flip over here and see what we've got. How many have we got tuned in this morning? I'm, I'm uh, still trying to get mentally prepared. I... <laughs> I have been trying to not drink so much coffee, you know. I, I wasn't just pounding coffee before the show. I was I was actually just scrambling to get all of my technical stuff in order. But nevertheless, we're here. 31 viewers. All right, thanks for being here. And so we've got Val is back. Thanks for being here again, Val. Carol. <clears throat> just taking a look at the live chat right now, seeing seeing what we've got going on. Hey, I'm currently in Santa Ana, moving to Prescott in July. Wow, cool, I was just in Prescott, Val. And man, is it beautiful right now. The, uh, the climate there at the moment is just amazing. We were at Goldwater Lake, really nice little spot. Get your coffee on, <laughs> yeah, for sure. We've got uh, my brother Ben somewhere, somewhere out there again. So, so uh, hopefully he'll give me a good nudge on the shoulder whenever I'm missing some important comments that are out there. It's just, just nice to have that extra set of eyes. But I'm gonna be watching too. Hi from the Netherlands, Ariella is back. Good to see you again. Hola, Liliana. Good to see you. Good to have you here. Thank you. What I'm thinking is, since we kind of just opened up a huge subject, there was an array of subjects mentioned in the last live stream, I thought maybe that generated some questions. This is just water that I'm drinking so that I can try to save my voice, that's all. Uh, I just don't want you to think that I'm <laughs> that much of an addict, that I have to have coffee when I'm talking. No, I just want to save my voice. <clears throat> Somewhere out there beneath the pale moon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, he's here. He's here. My brother is here to help. Cool. Good morning. How are you? Thank you for asking, Jesse. I'm very good. I'm doing fantastic. You know, we also have beautiful weather right now here in Flagstaff, Arizona, where I live. And it is a tremendous mood lift, you know, after a a long indoor season as we all are, uh, are aware of it's been so nice to get outside in this beautiful weather and and uh, things are things are very mellow here in this little mountain town compared to the rest of the world right now so i'm very thankful for my sheltered environment that i'm currently enjoying we'll see we'll hope that it lasts Put a slice of lemon in your water. Oh, is that a trick? Is that a thing to do? Lemon, does that help your voice? Have to try it. Luis uh, Prieto de este Canarias. Buenas tardes. Oh, is it afternoon there? Is it, uh, must be late in the day. Cool. Good morning, says Simi Saha. Good to see you, Simi. Thank you for tuning in. We got Wings and Things Studio back with a bunch of Happy looking emojis. <laughs> All right. I've watched you for the last two months, says Ernesto. You're an amazing teacher. All right. Thank you very much. That's nice of you to say. Immensely gifted artist. Thank you for doing what you do. God bless. Mural Joe. Hey, thanks a lot. That's too much. That's too much. You know, I am also just enjoying myself like anybody else. I'm just doing what I enjoy doing. So don't give me too much credit. Is this Q&A? Yes, it is, Jesse. Yes, and if you would like to start with any kind of a question, now it doesn't have to be, you know, I've, I've got plenty of things that I can think of to draw. We don't have to have a bunch of Q&A. I just thought it would be nice to open it up for those of you uh, that might be tuning in for that purpose. Good morning, this is Golden. I'm tuning in for my first time. All right, thank you, Chester. Thanks for being here. I appreciate that. When I used to cheerlead, says Leanne, I haven't read the, I, you know, I don't pre-screen these, so I, I hope this isn't something obnoxious. Not that you would do that. Many, many moons ago, we used to take shots. 
of Real Lemon to keep our voices. Not sure if it worked. You know what's funny? Is if you go back and watch my old videos, you can hear just how much my voice has changed. Man, I feel a little bit sad when I go back. I've decided, uh, my, my brother Ben and I have been talking, it's time to create some some uh, new material. So I'm going to be creating some, some uh, a new and, uh, you know, just, just materi material that I've been wanting to create for a long time. And I said, well, now I'll have some videos that look my age. Because since I made my last set of videos, which I highly recommend, by the way, if you don't have my uh, all video bundle, I think is the best way to go. If you go to my site and you want to know all of the technicalities, all the explanations of all the stuff I'm using that I don't have time to explain in these, then you can see my videos that I sell on my website. But I look quite a bit younger, I think. <laughs> so we were just talking about what a difference is going to be when I put out new material now. You know, it's been fun. It's been a fun thing. Love the painting hanging behind you. Yeah, you know, I didn't. This is actually the only spot that I have in my house to point a camera at a at a uh, some area of the house that <laughs> probably my family doesn't want on YouTube and that has you know a good place for me to get away so it was convenient I've got my big painting back there hey it's the stormy ocean scene you can look at the video uh, here on YouTube stormy I think it's just called stormy ocean scene and see that come together from Berkshire all right thanks for being here again now you gotta tell me do you say her talk Hertog von Berkshire, uh, thank you for constantly uh, keeping the, the uh, light mood on all of the live chat. I appreciate that. It's always fun to see you. Creative siblings, I know. Yeah, Mary. It's fun having creative siblings, but let me tell you something. Uh, we had an overdose in our family. It was an overdose of creative siblings. Ben and I... Ben and I used to be, I'm seeing if the guitar is behind, I've got a guitar somewhere laying around here. We were in a band with my other brother, Pete, there's three of us in a band. And, you know, we were just way too artistic, creative, sensitive, it was volatile. Man, too many explosive arguments, battles. Actually, I think my brother Pete was pretty cool about it all, but Ben and I, <laughs> we work together great now, but... Creativity, man, among siblings. It can be hard to manage. All right, well, uh, I, don't see, I don't see any big questions. Let me know if I'm missing anything. I don't see any big questions, but I saw one when I was watching back on Monday's uh, live stream, uh, and the live stream is going to be 9 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, Monday and Wednesday, for... Uh, for as long as I can maintain it. But for now, that's the schedule. Monday and Wednesday, 9 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. And that's a switch from what it was. Uh, good question, Jesse. How did you learn how to draw, how to paint so good? It started with drawing, which is my purpose for doing this. And so uh, what I was saying a minute ago was that I, I saw some uh, comments that I didn't notice while I was drawing on the Monday live stream uh, someone I don't know if you're here watching right now talking about uh, doing dragon wings in different perspectives and so I understand this struggle as a uh, you know I remember going through that over and over as I was constantly trying to create uh, things from imagination and, and struggling with the perspective of a flat shape that's bendy and goes different directions. And, and so this leads me to uh, what you brought up. Um, Je was it Jesse? Jesse? Uh, what you brought up about how did you learn to paint so good? I'm sorry if I got your name wrong. You know, I'm, I'm looking back. Yeah, Jesse. Uh, how I learned to paint was by taking all of my drawing knowledge. So if you look back at the live stream of the dragon that I'm painting from imagination, I start with the drawing to get a concept. But, but when I do that concept, it's almost like I'm drawing it on my mind because I, I, uh, I think through it 
as I'm painting it to think through all the three-dimensional shapes in order to paint it as though I were drawing it. So I'm, I'm beginning with my line and shape knowledge and then just filling in the colors. That's been, been my path on painting is understanding every color as a representation of some kind of light, right? So every color is a representation of some level of shadow and light combined. It's some flat side of some three-dimensional object. On my, on my phone, I've got many little shapes. They all have a boundary area. I could draw each shape, whether it has a blurry soft line or it has a sharp, clean edge, edge line, you know, I mean the same thing. Uh, regardless of whether it's a sharp edge or a soft edge, it has a defined shape. And so this is how I understand the world around me is what is the shape of that color right there. And so I just, all the light and shadow on my face, if I were drawing, if I were painting it, I would do it as though I were drawing it, thinking about the exact shape that these soft lights and shadows fit into and starting with the bigger, working to the smaller. Even if I don't do it in that order, that's what I'm doing as a mental process in order to understand as the shapes within the shapes, within the shapes that make the thing that I'm looking at. And I've found that everything that I look at, I know what it is by that way of defining it. I understand water to be water instead of, let's say, plastic. You know, if you just take a clear, piece of plastic and uh, you stretch it across something, it, you could mistake it for water because it's shiny and reflective, but very quickly you would say, oh, that's not water, it's plastic, because these shapes uh, uh, of the different kinds of colors and their relationship is different. And we have a memory associated with everything that we've done. So this is, this is the approach I've taken and just put all of my energy in life <laughs> toward understanding those things. So lots and lots of time just thinking about it, studying. I think that I was never able to not think about it. That's, that's the difference maybe between me and somebody that doesn't do this regularly. Is I, I, when I look at you, when I look at a person, all, I mean, I have to really strain to, to focus on what's important rather than the shape of your nose because that's the information that my mind wants to take in. All right, I feel like I've talked enough. Now we're getting into touchy, touchy uh, subjects, talking about what people's noses look like, which is expected in art. Huh? Okay, so this will be fun. This will be fun. So for instance, when I think about dragon wings, we're gonna switch cameras here and uh, I'll show you. I've got my overhead camera. And we're going to cut to that. This is the paper that I'm working on. And I'm going to just flip back over. Let me know if there's any problems with the visual or, or uh, anything comes up. What I'll do is show you how I think through perspective, you know, on, on uh, something like dragon wings. So let's say we've got a creature here. Let's put a dragon and we've got his chest right here. And I'm thinking of this as a three-dimensional shape and it's got to have wings coming off of it. So let's put a shoulder, put an arm. And I'm thinking like shoulder, bicep, tricep, elbow, and then maybe it goes up to here. And we've got the lower part. Maybe this is like the forearm. And it goes up to maybe a thumb. You know, I don't know the anatomy of wings so well. But I do have a good idea of how to make a believable perspective. And so I'm, I'm thinking through this arm is going to bend slightly toward me. So I made this slight bend as it's going up and toward me. And I know that if it has the, the fingers that make the wings, you know, like a bat where the fingers make the, what it, you know, where the, the fingers make the structure of the wing, then I know in perspective, a line that bends, bends even more as it goes back. So I'll think, okay, let's make the back side of the wing and let's, let's, uh, perhaps make one side lower, let's make it go up a little bit, then maybe down again, Wh wherever I want to go with that. So maybe this wing is like being flapped downward and this side's catching the wind when it's getting pushed up like a parachute. Well, what I want to do with that perspective is remember how scrunched these shapes need to get. If they were curved a little from a, a straight view, 
then they're going to be curved a lot from a perspective view, something that, that is flattening the image. And so I just think about that in whatever position that I want to make. Now, it's important that I also think about the darkness. So light and shadow is a big deal. I remember the first time I put light and shadow, I think I was drawing like the body of some cat or something. And my dad, he saw me do it and he said, look at this, look what he just did. He put, he, he understands light and shadow. He was really impressed with it. I remember that moment because kids love praise. You know, it was a real encouraging moment. But it was always a priority to me to understand. So if I put a dark line right here, then this is going to have a way of interfering. So you saw me lighten those with the eraser. And so now if I put a slight gradient, you know, maybe I want to maybe I want to just go like this and put light lines going lighter and lighter as they go back. Uh, don't underestimate the power of a well-done gradient. There, It's a very powerful tool to use in drawing. Even if that gradient only covers a very small distance, a, a gradient is something that is all over the, the things that we see, and it's a, a real big visual difference maker. So when I put that gradient on there, this gives a feel of difference in, in distance. So then the combination of these things, you know, here's the front of the wing. I'll put a shadow on this part that goes up. Maybe we've got some slightly curved lines so that it looks like this is now going back, right? Because this is the forward part of the wing. If I curve these lines just ever so slightly, you know, we see that. We see whether these lines are straight or curved, even though they're just tiny. So now watch this perspective right here. I'll curve this way. Now that brings this like a cylinder toward me, even though the front side is skinnier. So where that might have looked flat before, where this might just look like a two-dimensional shape, then uh, right now I turn it into a three-dimensional shape because lines like this around the, around the edges force the perspective of it. They force this side forward and this side backward regardless of this being the smaller. So this is how I can make a wrist smaller but still closer. And so then I go like this. If I make these lines now, you know, it's ama what's amazing to me is how I can use these and I can rely on, on any viewer's mind to put it together, you know, to understand. I can't rely on a computer advanced programming has not conquered this very well not compared to how quickly we interpret this so so you'll see the comparison of these lines to the comparison of these lines and quickly translate that these are uh, affected by perspective and that puts this elbow as a further point than this and this because of the curve of those lines then I can go here let's put kind of a shoulder muscle like this and put the wings going like that so now let's put another wing like this, maybe a muscle here. Let's go up like this. And now let's bend this forward again. So we've got the forearm going up here like that. And so what am I gonna do? The wing above or below? I'm thinking that we put that claw right there. Okay, so now we've got our skinny wrist. I want this coming toward me, this further away. So both of these are kind of coming toward me like a bat. And so here we'll go lines this way. So I'm curving this way. Now these don't have to be, I don't have to use lines. This is just a quick, easy way to represent. That could be any kind of texture. It could be just little shadows. It could be scales. You know, I could crisscross the lines, curving both, both directions. So I curve that direction, I curve this direction, but both of them are curving this way. And then maybe I have scales, but you can rely on human vision to quickly perceive that texture as being curved this way. So again, you know, uh, we, uh, you, you don't underestimate the power of the tiny choices you make with these little lines. So this curve now is a cylinder coming toward me, right toward the shoulder, this elbow is further. So now I'm curving this way like that and it brings this toward me. Then I can take this shoulder, put it out across the back, and now a wing. So where's that wing going to go? I'm thinking that we want to go like this. It's way back, like almost straight back. So here's where I can really curve that line. 
So this doesn't look like a bat wing or a dragon wing, that squiggly line. But perspective causes very distorted lines. So I could actually, uh, if I'm successful in making the perspective go way back, then I can make this look like it's not going down or out, it's going back. And that is why it has room to be very distorted, very bent. So let's put curved lines, try to get this perspective in place. So bigger right here, I'm using curved lines to go back. I'm gonna put another one here. Let's put another fingery thing right there going back and then let's take the rest of the wing and go up above the elbow now so let's go like this and then maybe back down behind again and so then maybe we've got just a spike here and so this is a crazy looking crazy looking uh, shape but you can get a lot of forgiveness for weird looking things if it can look like it's being affected by perspective so let's put Let's put a lot of little curved lines going back there and maybe we'll just put one coming off the elbow because this is my creature. I can make it whatever body parts I want on it. So I just used a series of slightly curved lines to go back here. Now I'm going to put a gradient and so I'm thinking slight gradient right here like it's bending back and I'll go lighter, lighter, lighter as it comes this way. That's going to put this edge going back and behind like this. So by having a smooth gradient, you know, it's like it causes the eyes not to find an edge. Then let's put a gradient right here. We'll go under here. The reason I'll go this way is because I want a shadow under that arm. If I get that shadow and go lighter, lighter, lighter as I go down here, like this, this gradient causes us not to find an edge and therefore not to define a distance. So a gradient is like a uh, dis a distance perception killer you know it, it gets rid of the you know as soon as I see a sharp edge it's like oh how far away is that sharp edge it's a shape it's an object so a gradient actually is a, a real good tool to use you know to demonstrate what I mean I can put a I can put a gradient behind this right now it's just a shape on white paper but let's say we go like this and put a, a gradient behind this, this whole image is gonna become so much more three-dimensional. So I just put, you know, let's put some sky back here. Let's put a, put a little bit of negative space in there. We're doing the blue between the clouds. Like this, let's put some in here, put some there. And I'll bring this right down to this edge like so and then let's go uh, maybe a little darker up in here like this and what I want to do is make the absence of any edge absence of an edge is going to cause this to instantly be behind my sharp edge sharp edges on top of a gradient a instant way to create depth if you want to create depth in a picture perhaps it's similar to the effect that photographers love to use when we have the when we have the shallow depth of field and then we have uh, a blurry background behind a very sharp foreground so this is a drawing i'm allowed to make these sharp lines all i'm doing is trying to create some distance i've got a sharp edge in front of a gradient and then i instantly have have uh, atmosphere and distance by just getting rid of the edges. So I, I noticed, you know, there were some questions on my on my galaxy scene as I was showing how to form clouds using edges. But if you just soften those edges enough that they don't come forward as much as the landscape, it's it's a matter of just softening softening them enough and not going too far. Okay, here I'm just making this gradient. And I feel like a lot of the lines are are just dismissed as stylized texture, you know, but I have a gradient. Now, I kind of did something not great with this gradient, and I made it in the direction of the wing. If I really wanted to get more, uh, more, more results out of this gradient, then maybe I would make it going this way, you know, different direction 
from the wing. Okay, let's see if I've got a fatter. Look, I've got this guy. Much better for doing gradients. Here, put this in. It's just a big pencil. It's not that the uh, tip of this is so different, but that mechanical pencil, it doesn't find a flat edge too well. Okay, so I'm gonna make this gradient get darker right here, and I'm gonna make it get darker in this direction as it goes up toward the end of the wing. So see how I'm getting darker as I go up here, I'll get darker still. So I'm not getting darker as I go this way, at least not on purpose. I'm getting darker as I move out to the end of the wing. I can get darker or lighter in any direction, but the point is a gradient behind a sharp edge instantly creates depth, so we can use that. So now, now if I do a shape like this, we're gonna make a, a snag of a tree behind it. Let's put branches coming out. And to make sure this looks like a tree, I'm just going to use shapes that we interpret as tree shapes. You know, so we're just going to make a silhouette of some squiggly lines that go down. They're going to slope down like this. We've got a tree. Okay, then it's going to go up like this. Get thinner, squiggle around a little. And we'll go out like this. Let's bring these branches. Branches kind of flip up, you know, they're finding the finding the light is what they're doing. So they go up from the trunk, then they go out. This is in general. There are definitely exceptions. You know, we've got some pretty crazy looking trees here in Arizona, but this is a good quick way to make a, a tree. You know, every time I say trees are like this, water's like this, rocks are like this. I know now that I'm 40, that if I make any absolute statements, I'm going to be changing my mind later wanting to edit my <laughs> that might clean. But nevertheless, this is a real reliable way to get a tree. Flip them up at the end, flip them down at the trunk, and more level as they go out. Now, that looks closer than this gradient because this has all these sharp edges. It's an edge passing through a gradient, a line passing through a gradient. That's really all that I wanted to demonstrate was that. So we've got these wings. We might as well throw in like a dragon body. So, uh, I'm thinking that this needs a neck. Let's put a spine going like this. Let's go spine, spine, just some bumps going along. And then we've got the neck coming out. And then let's put, let's make it look, I kind of like this curve. So, I'm going to put the head facing this way. You know, and then we've got the mouth. And it's going to be looking down this way. Let's put some, put some teeth, some good dragony looking teeth like that. Let's go down here. Let's go up into the jawline. You can see that this is my uh, default, my default mouth shape. I use this. <laughs> it's very common, you know, to have it up at the jaw, down in the middle, up at the nose. Not everything has it that way, but I, I like to use that shape over and over. I really should get out of you know, I really should uh, experiment with some different ideas. That'd be fun. Okay, let's put some eyes right in here, like maybe here and here, like this, maybe here. Put a little beady little eye in there. Put some shadow under the brow. Maybe a nose right there, like this, and put some, again, perspective. Look at these curves on this brow. That's to make that look like it's going back. Then we go over and down like this, maybe make some plates on top of the head like this. I learned this from, uh, we used to catch garter snakes. We loved catching snakes and I ratted my brothers out the night that they snuck out from camping in our backyard. They went down the railroad tracks, which we did every day. We played on the railroad tracks. That was our park, you know, that's where we played and not that I recommend that, <laughs> but uh, they went down there, they found this hot spot where snakes would just crawl out from under the mats that were left warm from the day, from the heat of the day, and the snakes would camp out in there. They, they came home with this, oh man, it was a, it was a good, uh, they, they came back with, with a, what do you call it, you know, with a whole bunch of snakes. They found a bunch of them. And I was so jealous. They snuck out without me, so I told mom and dad. 
on my uh, my brother Pete specifically. You know, he's the one that really got in trouble. <laughs> he remembers that well to this day because he was there when I said, Mom, if you know somebody's doing something wrong, what should you do? <laughs> I was really playing it up, milking it, you know. It was ridiculous. I'm ashamed of that behavior now, but, you know, it's just a funny memory. All right, we had fun trying to figure out horns on the last dragon. Look, here's something. Here's something fun. So I make this one go away from me. The curve of the lines is everything on these, you know. You can see me affecting. So here's a horn. If I want that to go back, I curve them this way. That's what I did. Let's put a shadow under that. Like that. Let's put a shadow under this one. And curve those this way. Now that goes back and away from me. Like that. And then let's put a neck. Put a few lines that just go up from the belly and around like this. And look, we got to put the spine in place. So I'm going to follow that line that I made for the spine. We've got the horn. And let's put the uh, put the chest in place. Let's make this like a, a second shoulder muscle. This is something that always bothered me. Putting a second shoulder muscle on an animal that has a shoulder at the wing. So this is the problem with dragons, you know. When you give them front arms and a wing, it doesn't you know, but hey, this is imagination. We're allowed to break, we're allowed to break the patterns that we see for the sake of the fun of imagination. I just, you know, I can't help but think it through. Is that going to work? It's kind of a lot of weight. <laughs> anyway, let's put a shoulder and let's put, look, we can use human anatomy for this. It's not human anatomy. It's just the best working system for moving limbs. We've got a shoulder. And we've got a bicep that comes out like this. And then we can put the lower arm right here attaching to that. I'm going to put this coming kind of forward. So here's that crease between the bicep. Now we can go up here and put a tricep. Oh, yeah, he's muscly. He's got a big tricep on him. Let's put this muscle in here. Here's the extenders. So that's where I'm going to put my... my uh, hand right here. We're going to put a knuckle, a knuckle, a knuckle like this. And then let's put another knuckle under that one like this. Oh yeah, we've got good, good sharp talons on him. Put another one right there. Put a thumb going around right here. And there, now we've got an arm in perspective. So an arm in perspective is the same kind of thing, you know, understanding what muscles can I put in front. You know, I just got to choose which ones are important. So if I don't have all of these, if I just put a few, you know, the presence of just a few lines, this one is in front of this one that's in front of this one, and this is in front of this one that's in front of this one, so that I can get the perspective of stacked shapes but understanding anatomy does help tremendously with that knowing that the you know where these where these muscles come from so i put a lot of time into that yeah these wings are way too small for this guy to actually fly but maybe he's just gliding i think they're big enough for him to glide all right any more questions we can uh look at <laughs> all right Mary's, Mary's talking to someone. Who are you talking to? Uh, I was mostly thought of as weird. I'm curious about that because, because as I was learning to draw, I, uh, I just had the perseverance to keep drawing when people thought my drawings were extremely weird. A lot of awkwardness, you know, in mind. Of course, I don't actually know what you're referring to, why people thought you were weird. You probably really are weird. People just thought I was weird. <laughs> So, uh, to learn all this anatomy, I had to start with very weird looking pictures. And so, you know, you just have to build up that, that memory of where those things are. And so you draw, then you identify, you identify what looks weird, and then you draw again. And I remember many moments in school, of course, if I was just doing my homework, doing my school assignments instead of drawing, 
would have been a non-issue, but I was really bent on figuring out the shapes of the world around me. And so I was drawing people and, you know, doing the weirdest stuff, straight backs, straight up and down necks, square heads. You know, it takes you time to learn these things. All right, we got a call from Ben, and so we're gonna see what's going on. I've got the, uh, I've got the text turned on so that we can do that too. Hey, good morning. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, good, good. Okay, personal style. Oh, that's a good subject. So, uh, yes, very good. Ben, ben just let me know about a uh, comment that I, I did not see. And so, style is a, a big issue, you know, that's an important thing. And so we've all seen people get very famous for a style that they've made their own. They get well known for that. And, and so uh, myself, you know, I'm probably the, a, a great example of really suffering for that because, you know, I'm watching people do work that doesn't take the hours that I'm putting in and make lots of money because people like their style. They recognize, oh, that's, that's a piece by so-and-so. You can see the style. They really like the style. They like the collectability. So it is a valuable subject. It's really something to be paid attention to. So my recommendation on style, and remember this is coming from someone that is probably not the best expert. But because it was asked, I just want to be honest. You know, I, I just want you to have, have an honest answer from me on this. I think style comes when you stop trying to have a style. That's, that's what I believe is the truth of it. You are so unique. It is very hard to duplicate. And so uh, I've seen a lot of artists in desperation to have a style mimic someone's style that is doing very well. And there's a career probably to be had for for those. Uh, I mean, after all, you can have a, a, a many rock stars spawned from a first rock star that brings a style. But the first always stands apart by a long shot. They they become the pioneer. And then when you become a first of a style. So uh, not being afraid to put energy into what you really love. I think tuning in. So for me, shapes and lines. I just want to find that line that speaks to me. You know, in my in all the perspective, all the color. People probably have different things that they imagine to be my style. But I know what really sticks to my mind is when I see a line that is just awesome. So the, a line can, can be a series of lines that seem like they're pointing to each other. And I just love what the perspective has done to those. And when I do paintings, I need to see attractive lines before I feel like I've done a decent job. So I'm always trying to put those together, whether it's in a series of lines. So perhaps my style is being real shape line focused rather rather than something that is uh, more just about the mood of color many many things can define a style but you can see as i'm drawing that i love finding a line and and then running with it and so this is what happened to me as I was just pursuing what I loved the most, what I could remember the best, and that's how I think the best styles are formed. That's how I think the best styles are formed, is by that method. So what I'm going to do, uh, just to finish this thing off here, let's go like this. Let's put our... Now here's a way to get, uh, get depth, get better depth is nice dark shadows in the foreground. Hang on, let me let me switch this out. Let's get some. Ah. We're a little bit short on pencil here. So the way to really get good depth is to keep the shadows nice and dark in the foreground. So here we've got a mouth, we've got a throat. And if I make this shadow real dark, 
then that's going to pop this whole section forward. It just instantly creates a perception of closeness by having that dark shadow, sharp lines, high contrast. You know, these are things that make something close uh, rather than far. So here we'll define these lines. We'll get this head to come forward. And then if I have these lines, just not so dark. If, you know, when I'm sketching out a picture, who cares? If it's an illustration, it's not important. But just to show that it does make a difference if you want that difference. By enhancing the contrast on anything closer, sharpening the edges, darkening the shadows, I can, I can get better depth in my picture that way. So here's a here's a fun shadow I can put in between the forearm like this. And then I'll put I'll put back legs here. Wait, let's put it where should we put the tail? Let's go like this. I'm just gonna build the tail, get smaller and smaller. It'll go back that way and maybe then it goes back and around. So let's go like this up here like this. And then we'll put lines here. This is going to be the tail going back and away. Let's scrunch those lines together and make a distant tail. <laughs> it's fun. Too perfect. So I don't love how predictable that is. You know, I just like a smooth S shape. Like he's swimming through the sky. But hey, it's just a fun little drawing. And then I'm going to put a leg back here. So let's put a leg here. And if we are already set up to imagine a shape we don't need to put a lot in place you know if i just put a few light shapes maybe that's a toe coming down i just keep it light in comparison to these edges that are here so this is light it's going to look more distant let me just darken this edge and bring this arm forward and so if i were painting i would do this with color or just with a, a darker color than this. I, I would just make sure I had some distinction so that this edge was real sharp against that background, just sharper. So then here, maybe we have another leg and it's like, man, how am I gonna make this look like a leg as it comes down behind this body? Well, what I'm gonna do is use your imagination by playing on what you already know, that a further thing is just gonna have less light shadow contrast. Yeah, I see the text. I see the text, and I set my uh, I set my phone. So ben, Ben's saying, "Hey, he's gonna notify me by text if there's stuff I need to talk about." Uh, and so I I set the open time on my phone so that I can uh, do a better job of seeing that when Ben sends in something. So he's bearing the burden of trying to get comments attended to. <laughs> Okay, so there I've got a lighter shape, just a trick that I can use in drawing. So it's like, oh yeah, that's some shape that's further away because I see that these are close. They have the sharp contrast, the sharper edges. So it brings it forward. And then, uh, you know, just as a shortcut to creating distance, I, I use a very light silhouette to make that back leg go further back. So now I'm going to put a claw going like this. And I'm going to put a claw. Let's make this one higher. Let's put a claw right here. You can see I like to work from the very ends of the fingers because then I can just fill in the small lines that create the depth of the form. So this claw here, I, I don't care how it lines up with these knuckles because it could be going at any, any angle. You know, if I take my hand and go like this, those fingers can be anywhere in relation to the knuckles. What I care about is the relationship it has to this claw right here and then what I'll do is just put curved lines going back to the appropriate knuckle after I get this where I want it to be so same thing here I want flared out claws like this and then I'll just put lines going back to where I've established the knuckles now I've got a hand that's reaching out now I feel like it would be cool to set up this scene a little bit let's put another let's put another uh, opponent to this guy here let's put a, a perspective on this we're gonna put a mouth going like this maybe something that we don't see every day we're gonna put a dragon from a back view like this let's put teeth here like this going up into this mouth 
similar style dragon. You can see I don't have a very broad horizon <laughs> on dragon styles. We're going to have some fun here. Let's put teeth going out like this. And then we'll put a throat like this. Thinking through the uh, thinking through the drawing. Let's put an eye like this. I really scrunched it so it's looking right toward this guy. Let's put a dark spot there and then just use a gradient. And then put a brow on it like this. Yeah, there we go. Now we've got a battle getting ready to commence. We'll put a big muscle on the back of this back of this fellow here and a big neck. Look at the perspective. I'm just going to blow it out. Boom, right off the edge of the picture. And then we can put the neck going down like this. There we go. Now, I said that I love lines. I love what they do with motion. And so I just want to show you, I just want to show you the way that I work. And this is, this is just to help try to make sense out of what I'm, what I said earlier so that I don't just sound like a madman. Uh, you know, I've got a line that I am very attracted to in this picture. And that line is a line uh, that goes from the end of this tail and zoop right up through this guy. So I've got this, I've got this relationship here. And I, I did that just because I, I love lines. So instead of putting this character up here or over here, or, you know, I, I just am imagining the flow of the shapes and, and I just like it. I just like the way it looks. And I don't have a, a great scientific explanation on why that's attractive to me other than I just like the continued flow of it as it, as it travels from one object to another. So let's get this tree off this, off this guy's face and put some put some shapes lines help me just build perspective because I can scrunch those lines like this there's so now I've got an interesting creature let's put like a ear on it how about maybe something like this and we're gonna go dark in there Let's go dark right here. This is like the crevice behind the ear. Then that gives me a place to put a shadow between the jaw and the neck muscle. A good place to put this muscle representing lots of strength. It's got a big old neck. And then I could put a dark shadow right in here to show this mouth. And let's put the tongue going out like this. I'm doing this scribbly slow line so I can put a shadow under that tongue. Then here I'll make it light. You know, make the bottom make the bottom darker, the top lighter. Oh yeah, now it's bending in perspective. We got to <laughs> He's going to bite his tongue if he's not careful. Okay. There, let's really define that mouth. So he's protecting, he's protecting his spot here. Let's put a claw right here. This will be fun. Let's put a claw right here. And a claw right there. And, you know, maybe we've got the, maybe we've got the wrist of the animal visible right here going over that hand. Okay, there, now we've got ourselves a battle scene. He's standing on this ridge. Let's put a... Let's put a cliff going out. Like this, and then put some shadow. See, once you've got a scene built, if you've got something believable, established, and it's believable enough, then everything else that I put in will get interpreted as what seems sensible for the for the picture you know it, it helps everything so 
everything works together to tell the same story and we want things to tell the same story you know we're always trying to figure out what we're looking at and so if you can just key in on these patterns like I can just put dots in between this because once we see those crisscross shapes it's like we want to see scales so all I got to do is just put a couple things telling that same story all it is is just dots in between these X's then I've got some shadow it's like oh yeah okay we've got scales on that on that underside of that neck you know if I just complete those shadows get that pattern in place that we're that we're used to seeing all right and then we can put some curves here put some curves here see how I'm just keeping this curve like that I don't make these X's right you know I made them almost the same direction because the perspective flattens it like that so I can just put a shadow at each one of these cross points because maybe that's where the scales overlap just a quick way to draw scales on a on a creature if you want to try it out He says, no, this is my spot. You can't have it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop there. We can do another, though. We don't have to stop the live stream. I'm just going to stop that drawing and take a look at who's saying what. Let me flip back to the, um, flip back to the other camera view so that you can enjoy my ugly face for a minute and, and uh, see what I'm thinking. So... I'm going to go back and take a look at comments for a little bit. And Mary C is, is uh, always good for conversation here. Really get a lot of movement in his forms. <laughs> yeah. Mine come off so static. Yeah, well, um, thank you for the compliment, first of all. And maybe this is why I love lines so much. Maybe this is why I love perspective so much. Because to me, they're inseparable. Movement and lines. I mean, look at how many companies have a logo that is, is made to feel movement. Think of Pepsi. Think of Nike. Think of... Um, Think of what are, what are some others. There's all kinds of shapes that have a swoosh, a curve. Some, a curve that's not just an even curve, but the curve is looser here and tighter here. Because somehow that, that triggers our perception of, of the 3D world and what it does to shapes. It, it makes us think movement. And so I think my love for lines, attractive lines, and then putting a body, a form and perspective along the lines I love, perhaps that just creates movement i would like to just you know give a non-helpful answer and say well i just simply picture the position that the creature is in and moving toward and then i draw in that position but i think that's not very helpful i there is a sense of movement that you get by by um you know by feel ra rather than just rather than just by knowledge i've seen uh photographs photographs of moving things that look very still so this is not the answer is not being realistic when it comes to movement necessarily but maybe finding the lines that cause us to see movement and then amplifying those lines i wonder if i could draw something to represent that movement what creates movement you know i'm curious about it this is an area of exploration for me, so I'm not sure, but I know that finding the right lines is the key to good movement. Flying Dragon looks like he's been rolling in the dragon nip. <laughs> he's got the circles around his eyes. Yeah, right, yeah. Whenever something's under an influence, it's, <laughs> it's that's how you do it in cartoons. Make the rings around the eyes, right? <laughs> Thank you, Els, for the compliment. I appreciate that. It creates itself, says Teresa. You should do uh, ballet or street dancers. Okay, that's a great idea. Let's do some people. How do you add so much movement into your images? All right, we covered that. Thanks, Ben, for staying on top of the subjects. And so let's, uh, let's move on and try that out. Let's try some dancers. I like this idea. I've only viewed six of your video bundle. Wondering if vids later on will help me with trying to find shapes and things for some reason. Hey, listen, uh, 
If you've bought some of my videos and that cost is starting to add up for you, I don't want you to overpay for my videos. I separate those so that people can get, can try it out, see if it's for you. But let me know. Send an email, reply to the receipt that you have that you got from my website. Let me know so that I can make sure that you get the rest of the bundle if you want it without paying a whole bunch extra. I wouldn't want anybody to do that. So just try it out and uh, I'll give your money back if you don't like it or if it's just not not what you're looking for. No big deal. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Amalia, Amalia says, I most mostly paint and do quick sketches to help me with that, but I think I will have to put more shading into my sketches before I'm happy with my dragon wings. It is amazing to watch you draw. Hey, thank you very much for that nice compliment. Thank you. And so, uh, you know, I I hope that this, this video, if you backtrack, look at it, I hope it's helpful in showing how putting the... Uh, strategically choosing how dark each line is and which part you put the shadow on makes a difference you know strategically placing those things because I remember thinking in my work when is enough enough I'm looking for something that I love and the detail just keeps piling up and piling up and and it starts to look like a complex mosaic two-dimensional, not 3D like I want it, and I keep piling detail in. It's it's the strategy of finding that close object, that far object, and that carefully placed gradient on that one part that's going to show the difference between them, and then how dark I make each line, because a dark line in drawing is could be a huge difference. It could be a difference between a deep crevice with dark shadow and just a light wrinkle on the front of a shirt. So we, we have to be real sensitive to how dark we make every line if we want a good three-dimensional drawing. <clears throat> so let's see. If I was doing dancers, if I was doing dancers, this will be fun. You get to watch me uh, <laughs> fumble my way through, <laughs> through something. No, I hopefully the practice will pay off. So let's see, we've got dancers. So let's say we've got a female figure. So I always think it looks, you know, a, a nice a nice line, a line that I really love on a female figure is the way the rib cage can bend back and arch down to the hips like this. And then we could have the the legs, you know, maybe coming down here like this and you know, if we if we bend it just enough, we might be able to do like a, hmm, let's see, how are we going to, I don't know what I would do with this shape. We've got a back, an arm, let's see, if we put a head right here, what's a very dancey shape? We could put a leg going way back like this. i got to leave room for, for the butt going up, and then we've got the back of the leg maybe going here. Let's bend it. Like this, we've got a knee. Let's really contort this body. Like this. And then maybe we could put a, let's put a leg going like this. I like that straight leg. Right there, bending a little bit at the knee. Goes up like this. And so this is a nice shape. I gotta figure out how to turn that into a dancer now. So maybe I could just uh, maybe I could just rotate the drawing. <laughs> Let's go like this. Ah, yes, like this. Okay, let's put an arm going this way. Let's put a shoulder and then put the arm going back like this. And then remember, I know right where to put that elbow because it's going to be right here at the thinnest part of this waist. So. Let's put the put the forearm right there and maybe straighter because if it's a dancer, then she's really paying attention to the to the pose at all times. So we're gonna go like this. There's such beauty in form. I love the way dancing really brings out the attractive lines of human form. Okay, so here we could have a breast going up to a shoulder like so. 
And I'll probably want to move that shoulder back just a touch because we've got a real, real broad shape right there. So shoulder there and let's shrink this down. Let's go to the neck. So when a shoulder goes back, I don't want to see that that upper back quite that much. And then let's go here to a collarbone, to a neck, and put the chin, and we'll put this dancer kind of looking upward. Like that. And then we could put, this will be fun, let's put a, a dancer. So we're gonna put, maybe where would the center, this is something to think about when you're drawing people. Where is the weight? You want to think about where is the weight because we are very accustomed to seeing the uh, a person balanced according to where the where the weight is center of gravity you know and so if you put if you put those off balance then it might look weird so I'm gonna put a hand right here and this hand is gonna to belong to the other dancer like this. We're going to go up like this. We're going to put a tricep here. We're going to put a shoulder on top of that. And then we'll put, and I'm just paying attention to how long I made these arms in order to make this one. But I got to be careful to make the, uh, the other parts match the length of that arm. So let's go like this and put a, a chest in place now. And so, uh, Ben says, your thoughts on digital art tablets versus drawing painting by hand. Okay, I'm going to answer that. And so I imagine he's calling me to let me know that. I'm going to answer that right now. Sorry, Ben. Sorry. Send me another text. Send me another text so I can answer this real quick for whoever asked that. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, digital art tablets versus drawing painting by hand. Uh, I love the practice. I love the practice that that gives. I'm just going to keep drawing while I answer that. I recommend it. I recommend getting a fun digital uh, device to uh, doodle on because of how familiar you can get with light mixing versus, versus paint mixing. They are very different. And so you can get really confused not being familiar with those differences and why they exist. But being able to toy around with mixing light directly on a tablet screen, I think is a, a really helpful thing. Okay, so here we've got our guy standing up. Let's go up like this. And what's funny is if I turn this this way, it's like a some kind of a superhero scene. <laughs> if I go like this, it's gonna be a dancer holding up a dancer doing some kind of a fun twirl. So let's go like this. Uh, digital. I learned so much by toying around with Procreate, the app that I downloaded when I had an iPad. I accidentally put that iPad in the recycle dumpster when I was throwing away a box of old, uh, an old produce box. And I just, I just put that iPad in that box real quick coming off of a job site. I didn't realize until it was too late, much later what I had done and uh, it was a gift from a friend. I felt really bad. I ended up saying it one day, oh yeah, that iPad, by the way, I threw it in the trash. Didn't mean to do it. Okay, let's put the foot going down like this. I posted a few videos. I'd have to really hunt through them because I don't know what those uh, videos are called, but I, I posted a few videos of me drawing things on the on the uh, app that I had on my iPad. And there was one where I was kind of exploring perspective and uh, just, just having fun with it. But in the end, I think what was most valuable was learning how to mix, uh, mix colors in a completely different way. Uh, well, just, just different. There are some things that are the same. Red and yellow still make orange, but Blue and yellow make gray when you're working digitally. And that's because they're made from all three primaries. The yellow is made from green and red light. And so when you combine the green and the red with the blue, you've got all three primaries and you end up with the gray 
results on your mix. And this is like nature. So if we were painting with the colors outside, you know, it's annoying if you're an artist that's used to those, those things, but it's really helpful for understanding once you get used to it, like, hey, this is the way nature works. I'm learning how the real world is put together. So here I'm putting a tricep, 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 tricep. He's got to have good triceps in order to do this maneuver. Put a good shoulder right here, going up like that. And then we're going to put the other arm. This is going to be, this is going to be totally awesome. We're going to, this guy is no joke, man. He is the real deal. I'm going to put the other arm going down like this. Elbow, forearm. And then we're going to put this hand going down and away like this. Okay, we need four fingers. Like this, put a finger, finger. There we go. One-handed, look at that. It's always fun seeing the display of strength with dancers. That's a big part of the performance is seeing that awesome display of strength. So I'm going to put muscle in that form. We're going to put this muscle coming down here, up the back, put the shoulder blade coming here, put this muscle that divides those, and then put the little muscles across the rib cage. I feel like he could be a little broader in the back now that I've made him one-handed holding up this girl like that. Let's put the thigh, put the hip. Here's a real nice concave that you can put on figures. I love this concave that is right here. And we can go rib down to the hip like that. To me, this is a real attractive shape that defines that right there. Let's go here and put shoulder in place on this girl. Let's put a hand right here and a little thumb coming down, maybe the next set of knuckles, next set of knuckles. I just think in sets of knuckles when I'm doing a hand. Where should we put that other, where should we put that other, uh, <laughs> put that other hand I'm gonna put a foot pointing down right here put a little toe on that and then we'll put a a uh, some hair on this character hmm I think that we need something pulled back this is a dancer so it's got to be pulled back Go down like that, up like this. Movement. We want movement, so I can't make it too straight, you know, too perfect. Let's put a little nose and a little shadow for an upper lip, shadow for a bottom lip, shadow for an eye. Isn't it amazing how quickly we see a face? I mean, just a few little dots. It's almost like we were made to pick that out in a crowd. Put a brow and put some hair. All right, there we go. There's our dancers. My quick sketch anyway. You know, a quick sketch of some dancers. And then I got to put the guy's head. I got to put the male dancer head. So let's put a arch on the back. It's got to go back like this. And then let's put the front of the face about right there. And maybe an ear right, right, maybe an ear right here going to the jaw, a nose right there, eye right there, mouth. There we go. There's a quick little, quick little head. What kind of hair should he have? Let's put that diagonal line that goes down on the back of the neck. Maybe a little bit of length to the hair would be fun. And then add some shadows here, quick shadows. Now we've got a more three-dimensional form. 
like this. Let's see, where would the tricep be on this one? Right here, here, and here. This would be the tricep muscle, so let's put shadow right here. And then shadow right here on the back. And is he uh is he buff enough? I guess I guess I might expect to see a little more girth on somebody strong enough to one-handed just pick up a girl like that. So let's go like this. There, a little more. <laughs> a little more meat on it. Okay, street dancers slash ballet dancers, here you go. That's my best best attempt in a few minutes to get that laid out. And like I said before, I've got a I've got a, a series coming out on anatomy. If you want to see how I threw those together very quickly, there is a very specific set of relationships that I constantly think about when I put these these people together. Notice on both of them, I started I started with this shape right in here. I started with the arch of the back down to the butt, and then the belly that follows to the chest. I always think about people from the middle. It seems to be a good building point where my where my uh, uh, visual recognition of people seems oriented from so it's it's a easy way for me to to real quick put the shapes together and remember what I'm doing all I'm doing is uh, redrawing the same stuff clean so this is the process with drawing you know you you draw it the first time and then the next time is just paying more attention trying to do it cleaner but it's, it's the same same idea same concept so I gotta tip this just the right way so that guy, if he's this way, he's not going to fall over. But if I go this, he's falling over. That girl is going down. This is a disaster scene if it's right here. Now it's a disaster. This is not going to be good. <laughs> it's a big accident. Look, this is a study on movement. <laughs> Look at the movement. If I go this way, we imagine this. Oh, no. <laughs> but if we go this way, it's all in perfect balance. So I guess that's just a lesson in the importance of weight distribution when you're doing people. That's funny how I can rotate that and get the different feel. Okay, anything else we want to talk about? I've got time for a little more. We are at, let's see the time. We are at 10.20. It's a long one, but we're only doing two live streams a week. If you want to draw something else, you can let me know. I'm going to flip back over and check out the comments. That woman probably weighs 99 pounds. Well, if the, you know, maybe the guy weighs 200. Okay, maybe the guy weighs 250. You know, real muscly, real muscly man might might be more in that range. <laughs> Why are we talking about that? Okay. <laughs> Map model in detail says Teresa needs a second figure for catching. David Bell, thanks for being here. David Bell says, cheers, you're a star. Parkour and skateboarders are also good for pointing out extreme weight transference in figures. Oh man, you are right. I used a skateboarder as, as my uh, subject when I did my how to paint a person video. You can see on my site that is mostly about uh, how to put just the right colors on the skin tone uh, on the shapes that we're familiar with. If you want to take a look at that video on my on my site, there's a version on YouTube just like the rest of them. You can look at it on YouTube. YouTube. How to paint a person. I did a skateboarder. Because at the at that time, my son and I were really into learning skateboarding. So we still go out and we skateboard together. We like trying to learn new stuff. But he passed me up a long time ago. A couple years ago. Point her toe, please. Okay. <laughs> Just for you, Carol. Just because you left the comment. I'm going to go back over here and make the toes just like you want them to be. Okay, let's see. Point her toe. But I feel like the toe is pretty pointed. All right, this one. <laughs> All right, this is for you, Carol. All right. I always was a rebellious person by nature. All right. 
I pointed them up. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. All right. I missed the text. How do you transfer good drawing skills to good painting skills? That's my brother. My brother's really looking out for us right here. How do you transfer good drawing skills to good painting skills? Okay. Uh, understanding that everything is, everything has a shape. Every blurry line has a shape. Okay. <laughs> There you go. Is that how you mean? Is that how you mean pointed the toes? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm being obnoxious. So I always put all of the I always put all of the lines, uh, all of the colors inside of a boundary area. You know, no matter what I'm doing, everything goes inside of a boundary area. So drawing was all about learning the boundary area for me. And so when I'm doing a shadow on something, it's never just a blob. It's never just an ambiguous shape. I mean, maybe there's exceptions. Whenever I say that, I find the exceptions, you know. But it's it's never just an ambiguous shape. It, it always has a boundary area that defines the three-dimensional shape. Okay, there. I pointed the toes because I actually do care about your desire to see a better drawing. Yeah. Oh, switch cameras. Okay, okay. Okay. So, um, hang on. I'm going to switch cameras here and talk to you after I get this get this leg in place. I was just pointing the toes. I was just pointing the toes for um, <laughs> Carol. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was a funny one for me. So, so uh, I took all of my knowledge about shapes, and so when you when you look at my face, you see all these blurry areas. I guess I touched on this already earlier in the video. It really is about understanding what shape that is. So here, let's just draw a real quick face, okay? Let's draw a face and let me show you. Let me show you something. Okay. Look, I have this, I have this fun thing right here. Uh, oh, you know what I did? Oh man, I am such an idiot. Hang on. Hang on a second. I switched backwards. Okay, guys, you gotta forgive me. You gotta forgive me for the blunder. Okay, I pointed the toes. <laughs> I thought I was on the other camera when I was on the one. I thought I was on the one when I was on the other. Oh man, I switched it around. Oh well, you can forgive me for that. Carol, Carol, I, I pointed the toes. I pointed the toes and I was making a joke about it. I was making them pointed the wrong way. I pointed them up. Man, I feel like such a fool right now. Okay, look, I want to show you something. This is my childhood drawings. This is a self portrait. Okay, so as I was learning to draw, this is the <laughs> young version of me right here. So as I was learning to draw, I, I was identifying shadows. Now you can see uh, you know, my age here, what is it? Maybe like 16, maybe 15. I, I was pretty young. I was in, I was in high school when I drew this. And so I'm putting real soft shadows in place. I'm learning that shadows have a shape. This is what you're seeing on this drawing is that, is that all the shadows have a shape. And, uh, then when I went to painting it, I, I found that my drawing skills were insufficient for getting color right, so I had to learn color. But then when I finally got color figured out, plugging it into these shapes, being very conscious of the shape of a shadow is how drawing leads to painting well. The shape of that shadow, and then with drawing I learned how dark, so you can see that I've definitely got difference in darkness. If I put a darker shadow here on this cheek, it's gonna look like maybe a bruise, maybe a, a bloody spot, may, maybe just a hole. Who knows what it'll look like, but it will not look like the coloration on the face. So I learned with drawing the importance of fine tuning those values. Hey, you wanna see some more of this book? I wanna show you this. Man, I'm sorry I did the wrong thing with that camera. That was dumb. I switched to the wrong one while I was drawing. But this will be fun. Here, I wanna show you some stuff I did at a young age. All right. Just tell me if you don't want to see this. 
I'm not going to go through this whole thing. I, I, you know, I can see how uh, uneasy this can make people. Oh, no, here we go. It's a life story. No, I just want to show you. I just want to show you a couple of gems that are in here. Okay, let me let me focus. Let me focus this camera, okay? So look. Let me just get this. Okay, that's not going to work. Let's focus on this. Give me a second to focus what we're looking at because this is a big old book. And I'm going to kill the light a little bit so that we can see. This is a real... This is a real gem of a thing to have. My mom was very nice to create this. Look, this is a book I wrote. This is a book I wrote. My mom saved this. 1988, The Three Space Travelers by Joe Cornelius. Okay, now, I don't want you to feel bad about your drawing because look, look at this. This is what I was talking about when I was drawing straight people with straight necks and kids were wondering. <laughs> Kids were pointing out stuff. That looks weird. Of course, they were drawing stick men. But you don't get you don't get made fun of for drawing stick man. It's like, okay, that guy's not trying to draw well. So he's got it, he's got a license for it. <laughs> Looks like they found some fun animals on another planet. <laughs> man, this is great. Danny the dinosaur. I wrote another book. We'll read that another time. That'll be a good <laughs> a good story to publish later. I want to show you my very first drawing ever. Okay, look. I can't even believe that we still have this. Look. Oh. Okay, this right here. Hang on. Let me just pull this. I got to be careful not to destroy this binder. Because I'm flipping these things over. Oh, look. There I am with my brother Pete holding me. Isn't that a cute picture? Look at this. Like you want to see a fun picture? Like down in the bottom. Down in the bottom left, that's my brother Pete holding me, welcoming me into the world. Isn't that nice? This is my very first drawing that I ever did. This right here. So if you ever break into my house to steal something, steal this. This is what you're going to want. <laughs> Very first drawing. I think I was three. Joe, age three. There you go. And we've got these things. So I was always really into shape. You can see, look at this. Look at this snake that I drew right there. I was doing the scales. You can see quite a bit different than now. So, so you know, I guess it was that question. It was that question of how did drawing skills lead to painting that spawns this show and tell moment. Uh, drawing skills or how I learned the shapes and lines around me and uh, that I was going to later fill in with color and so it is and so I've seen many painters rely on techniques like you're watching Bob Ross and there's techniques you're uh, whipping out a beautiful painting awesome uh, with techniques but that can be done with a lot less knowledge of those shapes and so my style probably reflects more of a a rigid trying to control uh, those shapes. I'm just going to let the light back in for a moment here. Okay, let's get a little more light now that I'm now that I've got that big thing out of the way. So, man, man I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I did the uh, thing where I was pointing the toes here. We were doing this right here. This is where Ben sent me a text, switch cameras. And then I did switch cameras in order to do the wrong thing. Okay, so this is what I want to show you. Uh, I was laughing at, at how this throws the balance off. Look, if we go like this, if we go like this, we've got this nice ballerina scene. And look, Carol, I pointed the toes for you. At least I tried. Uh, if we put it like this, we've got great balance. But then if we put it like this, we've got a disaster about to happen. <laughs> and so that's what I was laughing about when I, when I did that. And then if I put it like this, then we've got some kind of strange magic, like superheroes. That's what I was saying. It's like superheroes. So the balance of weight really makes a difference in a drawing. Okay, so 
right, we've, we've, you know, it's, it's going long. I don't want to exhaust anybody. Let's see how you're feeling. Should I draw more? Should I draw more? So we wrap it up. We've got right now, how many viewers? Let's see. They love the book. All right. You love the book. Thank you. Thanks, Ben, for telling me that. And so maybe in, a, maybe in another video we look more. If you specifically want me to look for something in that book, let me know. But it is a life story, so we can't just go through that the whole time. But thank you for letting me have that show-and-tell moment making me feel very important. <clears throat> Paige Murray is here. Hi, late here, soaked in the rain. All right, cool. We had a little bit of rain this morning. Landscaping, so cool. You'll be playing with new material. Yes, yes. Okay, so I want to show you something. Unless somebody has a real important question. Uh, Carol says, the deal with the toes wasn't even about your artwork, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> now, because a good dancer needs to think about the toes, right? <laughs> Would not give her a 10 without pointed toes. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. <clears throat> I just wish you would have seen. I guess I, I guess it was uh, maybe God's divine intervention to make me less of a jerk to you because what I did was when you said that, I said, oh, you want the toes pointed? I bent them all, all crooked like that, and I was laughing at my joke, but then it wasn't even on camera. It's what I get. That was my punishment for being a jerk. <clears throat> Ever use charcoal for plotting murals? No, no, I didn't. But I saw this. I saw this great trick. You know, when I do murals, I I just water down my paint and I just brush it on. So I, I do believe in sketching. I I think it's real helpful to sketch. But I have a friend, very good uh, muralist. Um, I'm blanking out his name. Man, what is it on Instagram? On Instagram, uh, Mark. My friend Mark down in, uh, <laughs> I'm going to get in such trouble for not knowing this. <laughs> I better get on Instagram right now and see. Because he showed me a cool trick. My friend took a pencil and he put it on a pole. Okay. So he would do all of his murals. He would sketch it out. So he's in one spot. He's got a pencil on a pole drawing pictures. And he's got a projector behind him. And he's using that. To do, uh, it's not Mark, it's Rich. Rich, I'm sorry. Rich Marks, my friend Rich Marks. Look at Rich Marks on Instagram. You know, he's a great muralist, really fast. He knows how to get great results fast. And uh, I was blown away. I learned cool tricks helping him out. And so he would take a pencil on a long stick and draw it with the, per you know, according to a projected image. I thought that was a fantastic way of doing it. But however you do it, I just think sketching it out is very wise. Sketch it out so you can see the life-size picture. There's things that you don't notice when, when you do it small. And there's things you don't notice when you do it big. So doing it small, then blowing it up and taking a look, I think is just ever so helpful. <clears throat> All right. So here's something I want to show you. The value of, uh, the value of taking drawing into painting. Uh, I want to show you how to draw water. So this is, I think, just a prime example of how the knowledge of shapes contributes to lifelike color placement. Okay, here we go. Let's switch back over to, is it possible to use soft pastels instead of paint? It's possible to use anything. So, you know, you can see me transferring between pencil, paint, I, I've used oil paint. Uh, one of these videos, I'll use oil. But, but uh, yes, you know, any medium just requires knowledge of what shapes you're going to put the colors inside of. Really, this is art. This is, this is visual art in a nutshell, is placing color within shapes and then choosing how to define your edges. So let's, let's uh, go back and get that overhead camera view. And I'll real quick, this will be the last thing that I do today, is show you how to draw water because it's such an excellent example, excellent example of, of uh, how to manipulate shapes. So let's go like this here. Or it's, I said that wrong, you know, I feel like I just fished for words in my brain to complete that sentence so I didn't sound dumb, but it's not, it's not manipulating shapes. 
drawing water shows how how we're thinking about shapes in order to draw water. So I'm going to put water in this scene now. We're going to have this guy standing in water. They're dancing in water. And we're going to put a wave right here. Okay, so I'm going to go very horizontal. Yes, this is a wave. And then I'm going to do another one right here. I just have to make sure that these shapes meet some criteria. They have got to be very consistently horizontal. So I'm going to go like this, make another horizontal shape, another one here. If I break my horizontal patterns, then this is going to cease to look like water and look like some other texture. The other criteria is that these shapes need to be widest in the middle. So this has got to be the highest point because as water swells, it, it uh, swells from a high point and then tapers out onto the rest of the surface. The other criteria is that it needs to be flatter and much closer together as I want distance represented. So let's go like this and make very consistent horizontal shapes. So I'm just being as careful as possible. You can see that every little accidental curve of my pencil results and an interference with the perspective. So I've got to go back to those as problem spots to correct if I'm trying to do a real fine-tuned job. So perhaps there is some room for inaccuracy on this, but look at this change of direction. These are sloped this way, this is sloped more this way. So what I'm gonna do is alter the direction of that. So if you wanna paint water, if you want to paint water well, then I would say understanding how to draw water well is, is a, a great start. Okay, so now I'm making this point a little bit more down on the right so that the direction of it is consistent with the direction because this is all on a horizontal surface. So I'm just meeting the criteria. What I'm doing is meeting the criteria for the light and the dark areas of water. I'm gonna put a wave right here. Let's put a wave right here. And I'll take my pencil and fill in more and more uh, of this shadow in between the tiny little spots in between my sketching so that it gradually looks smoother and smoother because I need to understand that uh, eyes are very sensitive to texture the value of a consistent texture, so you can see me going diagonal with my pencil strokes, as long as everything does that, it's, it's like we visually dismiss it as the style or the texture or the window that we're looking through. You know how you can look through a, a, a window that has a texture? Let's say it has like some kind of a, a texture in order to distort the image, like a privacy window. Well, you dismiss that texture as the window and not the images that are beyond the window. So this is what a texture in a painting is like. This is why I like texture so much is because it becomes a lens that you look at the picture through and is a great mood setter for that reason. So if I keep these all the same direction, then we can dismiss that as the, the style, the texture, the lens that I'm seeing the picture through. Whereas if I go a lot of different directions, then, then I'm risking, I'm not saying it can't be done, but I'm definitely risking putting the perspective, uh, altering the perspective of, my, of the look of my horizontal surface. So now here's what I'm doing. I'm closing in these shapes. These are in the foreground. I'm gonna make these rounder. I'm gonna close them in, and they're gonna be closer to each other as they're down here in the foreground. And they're gonna be wider in the middle because they're more circular. They get more squished horizontally as they go back like this. I gotta flip this paper. Let's just do this so that I can get, because I'm not doing this by, I'm not doing this according to how it looks. I'm not trying to feel my way visually through what looks like water. I already know what looks like water. It's a system that is exactly like what I'm describing. So it doesn't matter which direction my paper is. I just need to make sure that the lines are very consistent. They're all going the same direction like this. All the shapes 
are wider toward the middle and specifically toward the upper middle if I really want to get into the details. So we could adjust that. And then they get broader and start touching as they come down into the foreground because we're seeing more and more of that dark underwater color. What this is is the underwater color that would be showing and then we would have the, the uh, reflection showing. I can put some little shapes in between the big shapes. It's the presence of the big shapes and the little shapes that matters. It's not that every shape down here has to be big and every shape here has to be small. I might have a long wave back here. Here, let's put a let's put a long beach wave going across like this. Here, now they're on the ocean. There's a long wave coming through here. Let's put another one right here like this. I better get my phone ready just in case some other questions come up. Ben will text me if there's something that I'm missing missing here. So we can put a long wave like this, a long wave like this. Now let me flip it over so that you can see what I'm working on. Now it just fills right in. This all just plugs right into the rest because I know the criteria because I, because I am shape and line oriented and this is how I use my, my drawing skills because it is a skill that's developed to keep real consistent direction, to keep consistent shadows. Now. Here's some other things I know about the light and the dark areas of water. If I make it darker in the upper center, then I'm going to get the look of waves. Darker in the upper center, darker in the upper center, darker in the upper center. So look how I make a high point on this because this is where the wave spikes up and where we can see the shadows beneath the water the most is in that upper center of it. Now I understand that this is just one kind of water texture. You can have a lot of different textures, but if you learn what that texture is, understand what edges are facing toward you so that you can do the faces. You do the edges that are facing toward you. So look at the three-dimensional look on that. Darker here, darker here. So on these shapes way back here, I'm just going to put a little dot. Right there we've got a wave, right there we've got a wave, a wave right here. So this makes it a lot funner to draw a landscape when you, when you um, learn that any look can be achieved with a two-tone drawing as much as it can be. It's just like shifting a picture to black and white. You know, we can just do it with values and not with color. And then it's just bonus when you're able to add the color into it. So I can just add color to this to this same system in order to get a real believable looking looking uh, uh, scene. So now I've got water texture on my drawing and we've got kind of a, a high exposure. Let me get a little bit a little bit less light in this room so we can see that a bit a bit more. There now you can see see a little more of my shadows in there. So in order to really, really uh, take this to, you know, if I really want to want to finish this and have it look as realistic pos as possible, then then I would continue to uh, bring these shapes together uh, until I just like the texture that I have left, and and I really, really just make a, a difference, a visible difference, where now I just have a little bit of the white showing through down here in the front. Let's just color this whole thing. Now we've got a gradient. So there's a gradient where we have less and less of the water that is at a parallel angle to my vision showing me the reflection. So I see a lot more surface that is reflectable as I go up here because it's becoming more and more parallel to my vision. That's why I go darker here, lighter up here overall because I just want to have a lot more of the surface reflecting back here as it's more parallel to my vision. Okay, so then let's put a reflection of this person in here. And so we've got, we've got an interesting thing to reflect because it's just a line drawing. So I'm gonna reflect the lines. And the way I'm gonna do that is by distorting them a little, but keeping them in 
this uh, boundary area in between these waves. So let's go here, let's go right here. Let's put the line there coming down right here. Maybe there's some reflection. And let's put some right here and here. I'm staying off of those shadows that I made. Then I've got to scoop my way over this way to do this image kind of upside down. So let's put one there and right here. And let's put some here. It's on the white spots. You see how I'm staying on the white in order to produce the look of reflection. I'm just taking these lines, doing an upside down image that is squiggled and distorted on the white areas. I've already established my, my reflection area and my non-reflection area. So I'm not gonna put reflection across these dark spots. I'm gonna leave those as the underwater color. It passes right through the reflection without getting without getting intersected. So that's the way I keep this looking like reflection. So here we've got a hand. Here's, here's the surface beneath the hand. Let's go down this far to put the reflection of that hand. Maybe right there, coming up toward this body. There we go. Now we've got the reflection of my person on the water. If I had some shadow, and this was a darker figure. Here, let's put shadow. Right here, let's put shadow under this awesome looking butt. Right here. Lighter, lighter, lighter as I go up. And then let's put a little bit of a shadow right across that muscle. Okay, so now we've got some some uh, color to reflect. So I'm just going to come down here. Any tips for painting in awkward places such as behind a toilet? It is a silly question that Aaron wants answered. <laughs> I love that. Use your hand. It's dirty, but your hand really slips back there. Great. You know, put some paint on a towel. I, I did a lot of faux finishing when I had a rag anyway. So, you know, you just put the paint on a rag and just get it in there. I also have brushes that I, that I chopped the handle off of. Look at this. Look at this. I've got, let's see if I've got it here. Yeah. I had to use this one. Uh, sorry, I got to switch cameras. My bad. My bad. Okay, uh, so I was saying, <laughs> you can just use a rag, you know, use a, use a rag. Get paint on the rag and get get behind a, a toilet that way. This is a real problem. It's a real issue, you know, so, so you know, you can get in tight spots that way. I cut the handles off brushes when I need to get them in tight spots too. So if you get, uh, sometimes the cheaper brushes, this part will just pop right out. And then you've got just the bristles. And I used this brush to do, if you look up clouds in Plano, Texas, uh, you can see my video where I had to chop the handles off because there was a recessed area in the soffit that I couldn't get the full length of the handle into in order to get all of my <laughs> So, yeah, you got to be creative. You got to be creative sometimes. Okay, so now I'm going to finish this up. Uh, I just wanted to show how... Uh, I can do the same thing here if I've got this leg reflecting on the water. Let's go like this. Put a dark reflection here. Put a dark reflection here. A little bit in there. And the reflection color will be somewhere in the middle of the underwater color and the source color. So if this water is deep and dark, I want the reflection to be darker than the source because it's partly the underwater underwater mix you know so I've got a darker hand up there let's make this darker make this darker so it just depends on what colors you've chosen for your picture all right now this is all just a lengthy way to answer how can you take drawing skills into painting skills uh, for me they were never separate I had to think about how am I going to add color to what I already know how to do that was what I had, that was how I, how I had to do it. And so hopefully that's a very uh, uh, helpful answer for you. It's, that's as uh, much as I know how to say <laughs> on this subject. Okay, so now <clears throat> we'll wrap it up and we're gonna do this again next Monday. So 9 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. And I'm taking a last look, seeing what uh, we're talking about here. <clears throat> Uh, we've got, oh, right, from England. Cool. Very good. And we've got, 
We've got Aaron. Aaron Mason is best. It's good to see you, Aaron. I'm glad you came back to give me a little bit of trouble. <clears throat> just seeing if there's any last minute subjects that we want to talk about. I know we're on a 10 second delay, so I want to give just time for for a live chat to catch up. I take a sip of water. I don't want to cut off any last minute thoughts. You're welcome very much, Val. Oh, I appreciate you being here. You've been here like every single time. I, I've got your name memorized now. <laughs> I should be sleeping right now. Yes, you should. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you're up instead of sleeping. I hope you get some great sleep. Make cheap tools. Make great art too, says Ben. Yeah. Story of my life. You know? I think that I'm so trained in that way. I've known wealthy people to prefer cheap ways even long after they're wealthy. I think I would be that kind of a person. Even if I did make a lot of money for my, for my neighborhood, my community, I still think I would love going to the discount store because I just like the resourcefulness of it. <laughs> Teach drawing sand dunes. Oh, uh, I got Fari. Fari says, I, I got your first message about that. Uh, yeah, we can do some sand dunes real quick. Hey, there's no harm in that. So if you can draw sand dunes, you can paint sand dunes. All you need to do is remember to put contrasting light and shadow. So just think, add gray violet to the shadows. If you're painting them, make the color of sand, whatever you want it to be. You need a shadow color that's darker than that color and more purple. Just more purple. It doesn't have to be purple, just more purple than that color. And then you're golden. It's going to work. You have your light color, some color you've chosen for sand, darker, more purple for the shadow. A little bit. Don't go too extreme. These are sand dunes. You don't need really, really sharp, hard differences between, you know, you don't need super huge contrast as you have the gentle slopes of the dunes. This is how I would draw it. I would do it like this. Let me go over and switch cameras real quick. And uh, we're gonna put, we're gonna put some, <laughs> we're gonna put sand dunes behind this. Okay, it's funner to just add to the picture. So we've got these two people in a paradise having fun with a, <clears throat> with a uh, very technical ballet dance because the toes are nice and pointed. <clears throat> He's painting goblins behind the toilet. Oh, man. <laughs> I just read that comment. Okay. So now uh, we're going to go like this. Sand dunes. Let's put some sand dunes right here. And here's what always goes wrong with doing slopes. We make them too steep. So I've learned that I need to go really shallow on slopes. Don't make them steep. That's the first thing that tends to go wrong. So I'm just putting a gentle slope behind another gentle slope behind another gentle slope. And what I'll do is now put a squiggly edge and decide where my light is coming from. So let's put an edge going like that for this one. Let's put an edge going like this on that one. And let's put an edge going maybe right there on this one. They don't have to be exactly the same because who knows what part of the slope we're seeing. And now I feel like I put light kind of coming this way on this person. So what I'm going to do is make this match. Let's put light going this direction on these dunes. Let's put some light going across this dune. Right on that side of that line. Let's put light going on this side. And what I'm going to want to really pay attention to is the darkness of these shadows. So already I've got uh, not a dark enough shadow in my foreground, but I'm trying to keep it real light and it's just kind of tricky with, with a mechanical pencil. But I want to pay attention. I want to pay attention to the darkness of foreground versus background. So once I have these in place, let's get a nice gradient. 
like this that goes up to that light spot. Let's get a nice gradient in all directions. We want sand dunes to have gradients where they where they real softly transition from light to to a uh, to shadow. So I'm going to try not to have any sudden changes between light and shadow. Keep it all very gradual. So I've got sand dunes right there, but now they could look better if I just go darker on the foreground and lighter on the background. And so here's a ridge, you know, maybe there's another ridge right here going down off this curve. So do you see how I put this darker spot? That's just because I've got this shape right here defining maybe a downward slope. So you can decide where maybe you've got some darker darker ridges, maybe some some shadows coming down and put, put a few details. But it all just can be soft, it's just real soft, going from light to shadow. Let's go darker on this one because it's in the front. Now you don't have to just make one edge on this. I could put more, so watch. Let's put another one going like that. So maybe here I put another gradient, just real soft. See, I can put the smallest amount of shadows, but I just want to be very sensitive to how dark I make those lines. So for me, this looks great, but this is too dark. So I'm going to dab that with the eraser. There, now look how that looks better, and it looks like it's just on the surface of that sand dune. I can do the same thing here, put multiple lines and peaks coming off these. So anywhere you make a squiggly line, you can put a, a uh, you don't have to make the squiggly line, I'm just defining it before I shadow it. So I can put another shadow right here, and let's put uh, another one right here, how about, who knows? Maybe this could divide into a couple different ridges and where it softly transitions into the light, that's where it's going uphill again. So I'm just forming the three-dimensional shape by, by where I put the shadows and just letting, letting the lines and the shadows do the, do the work of making it three-dimensional for me. All right, now that's really gonna be the last one. I have officially run out of time. It's kind of fun to see our finished picture there, isn't it? Here, let's go like this. It needs to be framed on the wall in this in this direction. It would be fun if I put it in a frame just like that. What would it look like if it was this? Well, that's not bad either. That's kind of fun. It's a pretty fun picture. <laughs> if you want to buy this picture, then uh, let me know. I'll mail it to you. I'll sign it and mail it. Uh, otherwise, it's going to go into this pile with all of my there's last week's look i've got all of these drawings all of these are just loaded up with those drawings so let's cut we're gonna get out of here uh i want to thank you all so much for making my life fun it's always such a good time to see uh see you guys back again uh to let me show off it's the thrill of my life is to show off what i do share my tricks stuff that uh, makes I was always very frustrated not having answers I, if you go to my website then you'll see and I just put a little about statement on my website saying I'm here to find answers for a long time there was a typo and it was like I'm here to find <laughs> yeah oh well and so uh, answers I love sharing the answers. To me, this, the, these were just like life-giving. I was like, yes, here's something I can work with as an artist that thinks, you know, just very specifically about what is the shape, what is the line. I just need answers about how people are achieving that look. I like to just put those out, uh, you know, as much as, I'm, as much as I'm able. So thanks, thanks for being an audience for me, making that fun. Okay, okay, looking for any last minute comments. Thank you very much, Wings and Things, for the encouragement, for being along. I'm glad that you like it. You're welcome, David. Always, always a pleasure. I appreciate the encouraging comments, as always. So uh, I just want to remind you, we're doing this again Monday. We'll go back to painting. We won't just stay with drawing. That was this week. I wanted to give a good taste of the value I've found in first knowing how to draw things and taking that to painting. I just wanted to have a segment on this. Also, it was a lot easier to set up than the paint station. 
<laughs> for being honest, I was a little lazy. So uh, we're going to get back to painting next week. So I'll be thinking about uh, what to paint. If you uh, have anything you really want to see, go ahead and leave comments on the, uh, on the video. I love watching this back, seeing everything I missed while it was happening, while I was in the, in the middle of my drawing. Man, I really wish I would have caught that camera switch. I'm embarrassed about it. It's the best. Joe, thank you, Teresa. That's very nice of you to say. I like the drawing sessions. Good. I'm glad you like it. We'll do more. We'll do more for sure. Steve, gives them, gives them the thumbs up. All right. Thanks, guys. You're always so encouraging. I appreciate that. So I'll see you same time, Monday, same time, and we'll be back to painting. Okay. As always. I'm going to say see you later and fade to black because I'm building up my multitasking skills. So it's good hanging out. We'll see you next time.